this coil conversation. I appreciate your attending. Uh, thank you for coming out. I'm really looking forward to this session uh, because I am a fan of the flipped classroom model. I've done a little bit of it, but I haven't really invested the way our speakers today have. Uh, our speakers today will be Dr. Stephanie Veligol. Uh, Stephanie is a, an instructor in civil and environmental engineering, and she has flipped a class in that area five times. Working with Stephanie is Emily Mahoney. Emily Mahoney is a Schreier Honors College student and she's been a, a teaching intern with the class. She actually took the first version of Stephanie's class as a student and then has worked as a teaching intern for three uh, of the five times that Stephanie's taught the class. I was impressed when they came to me uh, the first time to show me what they've been doing uh, because they've actually taken a very a uh, very aggressive and logical approach. So they've actually been doing things and gathering data on different aspects of uh, what happens when you flip the classroom. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Veligo and Annalise. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to this conversation and sharing some of the things that we're doing. Um, just before we start, I do want to say I'm just so thankful for Emily and a lot of the ideas that we uh, that I'm going to talk about that we're going to talk about really came from discussions that I had with her and it was so good to have a student who could really talk about it from a student perspective as well. Um, so there are two main points that I want you to go away with today, the, or two main things. The first thing is uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what are some key, four key things if you wanted to flip a class. So these are things that through many trials and uh, may I say failures of ours, we have learned. And they're going to be in the acronym NEWS. And then in the second part, I'm going to let Emily take over at that point and she's going to be talking about her honors thesis which is looking at whether flipping the classroom increases student motivation. And uh, we'll tell you about a really interesting way of assessing motivation that we found and how we've used that uh, model to look at motivation in the flipped classroom. I'm new at all this technology here. Okay, so why did I decide to flip? So this is a picture um, of a typical classroom where I teach. Now the class that I will be mostly talking about is a large required environmental engineering course. So this course usually has about 90 students in it, 70 to 90 students. It's a junior level course. Um, and it has a lot of technical content, as a lot of engineering courses do. And so traditionally, the way that I taught this course was I had lectures where I stood at the front, just like this. Um, and I was even in this classroom for most of the time that I taught the course. And um, you know, I would try to make the lectures as engaging as possible. We would have our homeworks due every week and have exams. And what I found was, at that time, a number of years ago, I had a large shared office space. And uh, we had a large table in there and with a blackboard. And so the students would come to office hours the day before the homework was due. And they would gather around the table and they would ask questions about the homework. And those questions were often questions that I had addressed in class, maybe many times. And so after I kind of got over being frustrated that I had already said that, um, I would answer the question. We'd go, I'd go up on the board and we'd go back and forth. And they would say, well, I don't really understand this part of it. And we'd go. And, and we would have a discussion and maybe another student would chime in, well, what, yeah, what about this? And we'd have a real learning experience. And I thought, this is only happening with about 10 of the students, but there are another 80 out there and this isn't happening. They're not learning in this way necessarily. And if they are, I'm not, I'm not there for it. And I really thought this is the way that I want to be a part of education here. I want to, um, to engage this way with students. I want to give them the knowledge just in time, just when they needed it. And so what I really wanted to see, and so this is a traditional model, and you've probably heard Sage on the stage, and that's what I did. And again, the, the key here is this technical content. I had to make sure that we could get the technical content. So even though I knew that active learning was more, uh, was beneficial, I didn't know how to do it without sacrificing the technical content. This is what I really wanted to see. I wanted to be there when the students were working on their problems. I wanted, uh, you can see Emily here, <laughs> um, helping the students. That's what I really wanted to see for all the students, not just the ones that came to my office hours. Okay, uh, and so the way that, but, but I couldn't do that 
without sacrificing technical content until I uh, just it happened about that same semester that I was putting a course online for a summer course. So I had videoed um, all my lectures actually from the back of this classroom. That was the first time I did it. And so I had all these videos available. And I thought, well, what if I could just give them the technical content ahead of time? I'll keep doing this for one second. OK. Uh, what if I could give them the technical content ahead of time through these online videos? And then we could come to class and actually have that kind of interaction that I knew was beneficial to the students. And then I could indeed be the guide on the side that I wanted to be. And so indeed was putting those lectures online that allowed me to do that. And that's how I started flipping the course. And that's why I started flipping it. Um, and so we've done this, like I said, about five times. So this is my fifth time. And um, Emily was with me the first time. And we've learned a lot through that time. And so I want to spend a little bit of time telling you how I did it. But before I do that, <laughs> I keep hitting it over. OK. Uh, before I do that, I want to tell you what my recommendations are. If anybody wants to flip, these are the recommendations we've come up with. And uh, we published these results. They should be coming out. And so if you want to hear more about how we came up with these, I can share that with you. Um, but here are my recommendations. And this is my acronym NEWS. The first one is no additional workload. So if you're going to do this, don't use this as an opportunity just to shove more stuff at the students. They don't actually, it turns out, don't like that. Um, the second thing is experiential learning during class time. So you flipping allows you to free up this class time. And so it's really important, and I'm still working on this, uh, really think about how to give some experiential learning to the students during that time. Uh, the third one is weekly assessment. If you're going to give control of, of learning the technical content to the students, then I think a couple of weekly assessments, and I'll talk about how we did that in a minute, are really important to keep them on track. And they actually are grateful for that, so they don't fall behind. And finally, short video segments. As I said, the first time we did this, I uh, created the videos from the back of the classroom during a live lecture, and I would not recommend that. Um, I'll tell you what we did since then to improve that. So let me tell you about the specifics of our course. Um, again, no additional workload, so uh, we truly want to flip it. So this is a traditional lecture class. So we've got lecture here. Everybody can see me doing this, or no, they can't. OK. Uh, we've got lecture in the top in the yellow. Then they go home, they do their homework, and they're assessed later. So the learning and applying, you can see in this top one with the T, happens at home. Um, what we did was we truly flipped it so that the students get the technical content at home, and they come to class to do the same homework problems that they were doing before. And so again, I think that's really important not to shove more stuff at them. Um, E, experiential learning during class time. So last semester, which is where most of the data we have comes from, we had 10 weeks that was used to actively work on technical content. So again, the students would watch the online assessment first. Then they would come to class on Monday and Wednesday, and we'd work on the homework that was due Friday. And they'd also have a quiz on Friday in class. Again, that allowed us to free up more time for quizzes because I didn't have to worry about covering technical content. And you can see there a picture at the bottom of last semester. We were in a different classroom. Um, and again, you can see the students all working together for that. We also were able to have experiential learning during an, you, in a no, number of other venues, including field trips. For this class in particular, it's environmental engineering. Visiting places like the wastewater treatment plant are actually quite important for them. Um, not that they necessarily thought that they liked it at the time, but uh, this picture is actually from the day after Hurricane Sandy. So we just are uh, pretty tough, these civil engineers. So um, we still went out there and toured it. And actually, it turns out that the students really, really see the value of the material when they go on these field trips. So we actually were able to go on five field trips. Previously, that was prohibitive because of the size of the class. So here, what I can do is split up the class into three groups and take them on various field trips um, during class time because I'm not worried about the technical content being covered. We also have expanded this to include more discussions and brainstorming this semester. And we also have about three or four guest speakers that come in. Uh, and then the W is for weekly assessments. So we have two weekly assessments. The first one is the weekly gate. This is an online assessment they take after they watch the online material. And so it's a not a high stakes quiz. I call it assessment, so it doesn't sound like a quiz. And um, it just makes sure that they're following along and watching the videos. 
It also gives them an opportunity to ask questions. So I ask, what are the clear and muddiest points of, the, of this module in that quiz? And it counts for a point out of, the <laughs> out of the assessment. And the nice thing is that allows me to come in Monday morning and address those specific concerns. So they actually, one of the concerns with flipped is students don't get to ask questions. But in my experience, they actually ask more questions because I, I kind of force them to on this quiz. They don't have to feel intimidated. Nobody sees the questions that they're asking except for me. And so I find that I get more feedback. And then I can specifically address that when class starts on Monday. And that's the first thing I do when they come to class is address. If I see that a lot of them are struggling with the same topic, I'll give them a little bit of a review uh, of that topic and specifically address their concerns. And then the second um, assessment is a quiz every Friday or maybe every other Friday. And that's on the week that the material covered in that week. I just spoke to a student uh, last week who came in for office hours. And she actually said she does feels like she does more work in my class than other classes, but she didn't feel overwhelmed by it. She thought she could do the work and get help with the work and, and find out on Friday whether she knew the material or not. So again, that's weekly assessments. And that keeps students on track. And then finally, uh, short video segments. So after my first experiment with just capturing the video during a live lecture, I went to creating lectures actually kind of similar to this. And you can see that, um, and I know it's really small, but that white, uh, the white board up there, that's what the students see. And you can do this in any number of ways. I have outline notes that I write on. I write on a tablet. Um, and the students still see me at the bottom. And that's optional. But the really important thing is what you can see there in the yellow. And so this is one week's module. This happens to be in wastewater treatment. And I broke that up into smaller video segments. The goal is really, I think, 10 minutes or less. Um, I didn't always reach that goal, especially early on. Now I am better at breaking it up. But I, I don't just like set the timer and stop it in 10 minutes. I really try to have a cohesive piece for every video segment. And that allows students to go back and selectively review a specific topic. So you can see here they're well labeled um, so that if they, they forget one piece, they can just go back and watch that. They don't have to go back and, and watch the whole segment. They can selectively decide what they want to rewatch. And so again, news, those four things, no additional workload, experiential learning, weekly assessment, and short video segments. Those would be my recommendations if you were to flip a course. So we did a lot of um, our own assessment of students. And um, you'll be <laughs> happy, to, or I, I was happy to know that, and we've done this a couple of times, but last semester about, or I should say, I'm sorry, fall of 2002, um, when we assessed them, 77% of the students said that they would prefer to take a flipped class. And the specific question we said is, given the same instructor and a similar material, would you prefer to take a flipped class or a lecture class? And 77% of them said flipped. Um, I will say that Emily and I have both had this experience at the beginning of the semester. Students tend to get a little bit nervous about it. Um, but we usually win them over by the end after they experience it. So then we asked them why. If you chose that you would prefer a flipped class, what are the reasons? And that was an open-ended question. And so we were able to look at all of those answers and see common themes. And there were three common themes that came out in terms of student preference. <laughs> Keep flipping the normal way. OK. Uh, the first one is flexibility in how they learn. So this is a typical quote. We got a lot of these. Flipping the course gave me more freedom toward how I wanted to complete the work. About 35% of the students in somewhere in their comments mentioned flexibility in learning. This could be uh, when they learn in, in terms of they want to learn in chunks. They want to learn it throughout the, the week. Or maybe they want to learn it all at once. It could be how they learn. Um, where they learn. So we've gotten a lot of comments that students really prefer having control of their own learning of the technical material. The second thing that we heard over and over again was the students enjoyed and preferred being able to review their lectures. And they also mentioned it helping them with focus. So I'm sure we've all had an experience, uh, maybe even right now, where you start to lose focus in what someone's saying. And so you would like to pause it to take a little break, to take a drink or to whatever, you know, walk, take a little walk. And maybe you zone out for a minute. And you think, well, if I could just rewatch that, I totally lost what they just said. And I'm lost now. And sometimes with technical material, if you get lost, you can't get back in. Um, and a lot of students, 
especially in a large engineering classroom, are hesitant to raise their hand to stop and, and ask the, the professor to go back. So students really enjoyed this. Um, another student just even last week said that in other classes she's really afraid. She feels like everyone else is, understands it but her, and so she doesn't want to ask a question. And so she's just lost for the whole time. She said, in my class, she can go back and rewatch segments or stop it and pause it. And, and that gives, again, her control over her learning. And then finally, again, about 35% of the students um, mentioned something about enjoying that interaction with the peers and the faculty. So um, this one said, I found really interesting the fact of solving in-class problems since I have the opportunity to exchange my ideas with others and have a different perspective of what is shown. And we saw this over and over again. They really enjoyed working with their peers. They knew that they could raise their hand and get help wh exactly when they needed it. And our experience still is sometimes we stop the class and say, OK, everybody's stuck on this. Let me go up to the board for just a minute and show you this. And the students really prefer it. And so our experience in general has been very positive. Uh, the students do prefer it. Um, again, it gives them more freedom in their learning, more control. And it allows us as faculty and as teaching interns to really be more interactive with them. And it's much more, I think, rewarding from our standpoint as well. And so students prefer it. And so we thought that was great that they prefer it. But then we, um, and I'm going to let Emily take over in a minute, we, we, and this was really Emily's drive, was, well, is it motivating them to learn? Is it really having an impact in that way? And so I'm going to let her take it from here. All right. Hi, everyone. Okay, so one of the hardest things about teaching a class or even taking a class as a student is that it's almost impossible to teach to every student. There's no such thing as a stereotypical student. You get some students who feel like this. They say, this is so boring. There's no point to this. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Who else cares? Um, you also have students who feel like this. They think that the material is too hard. They have a hard time keeping up with the pace of the class. They think that the professor isn't willing to help them or they're embarrassed to ask questions during class. And so they just give up. And honestly, personally, as a student, I have been both of these students, and I have been every combination of these students. The majority of my classes, I either don't care, give up, it's not what I want. So the first time that I took this um, environmental engineering class was the first time it was flipped, and I loved it. I felt that I got a lot more out of it because I had control over my own learning. And I really wanted to look into to see if other students felt the same way. And so I became a teaching intern so that I could help teach the class, learn more about teaching in general, and also kind of see if this motivates students to learn. Um, I actually decided to do my honors thesis on it. So we've been doing a lot of research on it for the past two years. Um, one of the first things that I did was look into some of the literature for motivation. And we found this great book called How Learning Works. Uh, the site is there at the bottom of this slide. And the main key point that we took away from this book was that motivated students believe they can do well, see value, and feel supported. This sentence refers to three different levers that all interact to cause a motivated student. You'll see here on the left in red, it talks about student self-efficacy. This refers to whether or not a student is confident that they can actually do what they're expected to do. Uh, the green represents the supportive environment, or we're going to refer to it as classroom climate. Um, and then the blue represents whether or not they see value in the class. And so as you can see, it's only when all three of these things are working together that a student actually feels motivated. So at first, let's take this student for example. He thinks the material is too hard, so he has low self-efficacy. And he thinks that the teacher isn't going to help him, so he has a, thinks that the environment is unsupportive. Students like this, they typically feel rejecting or hopeless. They don't think they can do it. They don't think there's any, it doesn't matter, they're not going to do it. They just give up entirely. And then you have this student. She thinks that it's very boring, probably because it's too easy for her. Everything is going too slow, and she's just zoned out. And it's pointless. She doesn't see any value in the subject. And so she also she doesn't care, and she gave up. So students who have high self-efficacy and low subject value, they are evading. They just don't see the point of following through with it, so they just avoid it. So what we decided to look at was whether or not flipping a course lets us focus on these three levers more in order to get students to be motivated. Um, our first hypothesis was regarding the self-efficacy in red. Uh, we thought that if you flip the class, then you're able to spend a lot more class time doing problem solving, which should give students a lot more confidence in being able to solve these problems. Um, in order to analyze this, we gave them a series of questionnaires. And here you can see an example of one. 
what we did is we chose one of the hardest materials that we teach, which is weak acids. It's one of the first materials that we teach, and it's a material that students typically have a very hard time with. They just think it's the worst. In general, nobody really likes it. Uh, so we picked that one because we decided there could be the biggest differences in terms of how confident they feel by the end of it. And so what we did is we asked them several steps of solving a weak acid problem. At the top of the slide is an example of one of the very last steps, putting everything together to actually solve the problem. And we asked them to score how confident they felt doing this on a scale of 0 to 100. Here you'll see a schedule of our course. It's similar to the schedule that Dr. Velgo mentioned earlier. Uh, the Friday before class, students so far haven't learned anything. They haven't watched the lectures. Um, they haven't done the homework. Now, some students can. Since you have control over your own learning, you can watch the lectures well ahead of time. But we took those students out of the sample poll because we really wanted to consider how students felt before having learned anything from us just based on their own knowledge. So the first quiz we gave was on the Friday prior to them doing anything. Uh, the second quiz that we gave was Monday before class. At this point, they've already watched the short video segments online at home, and they've taken the online assessment to make sure that they've actually watched the video segments. And this would just be to see what the difference is between watching the assessments and doing the preparatory work. Uh, the next quiz that we gave was after class on Monday. And so at this point, they've had an entire class session to work with the TA and the instructor and their peers just working on the problems to see if that helps them feel more confident in solving it. Uh, the next one that we gave was Wednesday after class. And so at this point, they've gone home, worked on the homework, studied. They've come to class for another session, worked some more on the homework and studied. And the final one that we gave was on Friday before a quiz. At this point, they have completed the homework, assuming that they handed in the homework, and studied for the quiz, which we gave after this questionnaire. And here are our results. Uh, we found that self-efficacy continues increasing throughout the week. The biggest jump was in this very first section, which is just their prior knowledge. For the most part, they had very low self-efficacy without having known anything about the material. They didn't think they could do it, which makes sense. And then after watching the online videos, there was a pretty big jump of about 28% in terms of how well they felt that they could do it. However, throughout the rest of the week, uh, the scores kept going up to eventually getting a score of 95, which means that the students, for the most part, felt that they could all do this problem perfectly correct. And so there was another jump just between the experiential, experiential learning that we were able to do in class. And so the key point that what we got out of this is that the self-efficacy keeps increasing. And so in a normal traditional lecture class, you usually only have the lecture component. You might have some homework and studying at home on your own time, but not necessarily. And so you might only get the self-efficacy to go up to, say, that 77 value that we have. Uh, one limitation of this is that we don't have a control group. If we were to do this again, we would try to find a traditional class to compare it to so we could actually see how these numbers compare for traditional learning. The next lever that we looked at was supportive environment. And so for this, what we did is we administered an inventory called the College and University Classroom Environment Inventory. The way that this inventory is set up is there's a series of seven subscales that all relate to different parts of classroom climate. And if anyone has questions about this, I can go into it later on. But the key point was that we asked them all these different things. They responded. And then we wanted to see if flipped made a difference overall. We gave this survey to three groups of students, which are shown here in the table on the left. Uh, the first group, which is circled, is our flipped class. So this is the class that we were flipping. Uh, the second group was the same lecture material, but taught as a traditional course by a different instructor. And this was to control for the material itself causing any differences in classroom climate. The third group that we presented it to was a, another class taught by Dr. Veligal. It was a different subject. It was actually a senior level environmental engineering class, and it was an elective instead of a required course. But in this case, we wanted to account for the differences that the same professor might have on classroom climate. And so we analyzed the data using a one-way ANOVA, and we found that there was a statistically significant difference between our flipped class and both of the other classes, which is what we hope to see, so we're pretty happy about that. Um, but the most interesting part of this is that we found that one of the biggest jumps was in the individualization subscale. And so you can see here at the top of the slide what that means. Um, it's the extent to which students are allowed to make decisions and are treated differentially. 
And this is really one of the biggest points of FLIP, is that we're able to treat all these different students as individuals. They can control the learning so they get out of it what they want to get out of it. Like I mentioned in one of my first slides, you have these students who don't care and think it's boring and pointless. You have these students who think it's way too hard and have given up. And this helps us to tailor the class to both of them so that both of them feel comfortable in the environment. And so we were pretty happy about that. All right. And then our third hypothesis was regarding this subject value lever. And we thought that flipping a course would allow us to have activities that would cause students' perception of value to increase. Uh, this is something that we're still working on finding a good way to judge this in terms of actual data. But for now, what we've done is we had a series of surveys and focus groups where we just asked students open-ended questions about the course, and they could talk about it. And the main thing that we got out of it is that the biggest thing that caused students to see value were the field trips. They really liked being able to see everything that they were actually doing in class and relating it back to the real world. And here we have two quotes that students gave us. Uh, the first, you get a feel for what you're actually doing while on field trips. So they can see that these aren't just numbers that we made up. They're not just random equations you're plugging stuff into. It actually matters, and it's something. And the second one is you actually get to see things close to campus that are relevant to the class, and you get to relate back to the class. And that was another key thing with our field trips, is we were lucky enough to have most of our field trips being either on campus or very close to campus to fit in during our short class period times. And so they got to see that these things, they're happening right here, right now, on campus. It's not something that's happening in a completely different country. It's just happening everywhere, and they can actually handle these problems and work on it. And so in conclusion, we found that flipping the class can improve self-efficacy, classroom climate, and value, and it'll lead to higher motivation. And so now if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> so uh, we're inviting people to put questions in the uh, chat box. What happens here? Anything else that's happening? Okay, what, software? what software do we use to record and distribute the lectures? Um, well, I use um, PDF Annotator. All this work actually with continuing and distance education, which you can see there, Deb Zimmerman is helpful, and then Mike Seacrest was the one who did that. Uh, one of the problems with Angel, and I don't, I, I'm not a technical person on this, but um, you can't host all those videos on Angel, so you have to, you guys probably know, create a separate link that goes to it. Um, but working with them was critical for me, but I think there are other ways to do it. That's how we did it. So I had a tablet, PC, and actually eventually then a screen, and I create everything in PDF and just throw it on top of it in PDF annotator. What was your response rate for the data? Okay, I can answer that one. <laughs> all right, so we planned out all of our surveys so that we gave them on days where students had to come to class. We gave it to them on the same days where they would have a quiz, and we just shortened the quiz that day. And so this way, we were able to get almost every single student responding. Um, at first, we had thought about just setting aside an extra time for students to respond and get extra credit. But if you do that, you only get students who are either really worried about their grades and want the extra credit, or the overachievers who come to everything. And we wanted to make sure to get the whole spectrum of the class. So we made sure to do it on days when students had to come. So it was really almost 100% of the class responded to our surveys. Especially in nice. classroom climate. Yeah, especially on classroom climate. Some of the other surveys we did, um, some of the other surveys we did online, uh, they filled out a um, Qualtrics. Qualtrics. And we gave them extra credit. Like, they were part of actual um, study. You know, we got uh, permission from IRB to do the study. So I think at those, we probably had a 70% rate yeah. uh, for the general surveys. And then Emily did a number of focus groups, which was really helpful. In fact, one of the focus groups, and she didn't mention this, that she did is uh, she took students that had taken the flipped class with me, the, the first class, and then the follow-up class they took with me, but I taught it live. I, I taught it lecture-based. And so there's about four students who had had both. And two of them were actually in both at the same time. Um, and so she had a nice focus group of those just to, just to talk up really about some of the differences. So we also had focus groups in a lot of surveys. OK. Right, and there's a question about homework. So did they have homework outside of class? Or should I feel the only? OK, so they had homework um, that was due on Friday. And it was really up to them. They would come to class, and I would do a, a short uh, <laughs> review, as short as I could. And then give the rest of the time for homework. I would, I mean, I still do this. I try to guide them towards maybe one of the harder homework problems to start with, because I figure if they can get that done in class, if they don't get it all done in class, they can go home and do some of it at home. Um, 
And Emily and I are there just walking around, sort of helping them solve that problem. But there's no additional work. It's the same homework they would have had if we had a lecture-based class. The other thing that's interesting, because I know time is something that I used to get a lot of complaints about from students. They used to say it feels like, you know, it um, should be worth more credit or something. But when I shortened the videos, they didn't have that response. And it turns out that if you record your videos in a studio like I did, you can shorten the time uh, about two-thirds or half of what you would normally do in a lecture. I, I spent a lot of time in lecture trying to keep people awake and, <laughs> you know, keep them going. Um, and talking about other things that don't have to do with the technical content. So I tell them, you know, you really only have about an hour and a half to watch a week. It's not a three-hour time like it would be. So I don't really get complaints about time much anymore. All right. And then there's a question about students who did not prefer the flip. Why? Oh, okay. So um, that's a good question. That's in our paper that I didn't bring. But um, I think there were three reasons. One of them, this was probably out of 70 students, we're talking about 15 students. So about Five of them mentioned that it took, they thought it took too much time. Um, a few of them usually mentioned something about, you know, they're just not used to taking classes this way and they like, some people, some students really do like to come and sit and, and literally not engage. Uh, they really kind of prefer that. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was another reason that is striking me. That was the biggest one. We had some students who, they were seniors and it was their very last semester. And so a lot of those students, this was something brand new after four or five years of doing the same thing. And so people can be resistant to change. And so we had some difficulties with students like that who just, they weren't used to it, and so they just shut down and weren't willing to get involved in it. And so that was what some of the responses were. Mm -hmm. yeah, good. And now we have a question K through 12. We'll oh. talk about that after class. Sure. Um, we have not done anything with K through 12. You know, I'm an engineer. <laughs> I mean, I think education is great. Uh, I leave that for the education people. But um, I have read a number of studies. New York Times had an article, uh, and I don't have the reference for it, but where they talked about flipping an entire high school. I think it was a high school, right? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a lot done in K 12, and uh, all you can, uh, if you go to YouTube and just Google the flip classroom, there some by Katie Gimbar. Mm -hmm. uh, she's done a lot, even with, with videos for teachers on how to flip the classroom. Mm -hmm. so, uh, just go to YouTube and Google uh, Flip Classroom. And at the top, there's a Bill Sam. Uh, Bill Sam, uh, somebody uses Sam's. Okay. One. And, uh, anyway, you'll, the, a lot the of people most doing popular it. videos out there are sort of classics. And a lot of, there's a whole school mm -hmm. that's flipped. A whole mm -hmm. high school that's flipped the whole high school mm -hmm. after a couple of years of gathering data. So uh, if you, if you want to have an email me, I'll send okay. my email in the chat okay. box. If you email me, I'll send some K-12 there's, um, I mean, just, you know, from my experience, I think flipping a math class would be phenomenal. I mean, not only would it help the student, but it would also help the parents. You know, often, I mean, I have kids myself, and the kids come to the parents for help. And if, you, if the parent doesn't know exactly, I mean, I teach engineering, I should know math. But if I don't know exactly what, how the teacher's showing them the math, it can be difficult to help. But having that video is really nice. Are you? Okay. Someone wants to see the study when we publish it. Oh, good. So you well. talk about the paper <laughs> where I published it. Yeah, so we do have a um, public a, a paper that we have submitted and gotten accepted in advances in engineering education, so we'll get that out as soon as we can. Uh, the attendance, somebody asked about attendance, and that, I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, honestly, for these problem-solving sessions, it's uh, not critical that they all come, in my opinion. I don't require them to come. I want them to learn the material, and there are some students who prefer to learn at home and can do it on their own. They may be one of these students who have self high self-efficacy and don't need the extra help. Uh, there may be students that don't care and they don't come anyway. Um, I actually counted this week. I think we were at about 70% attendance. That's, that's pretty typical during these problem-solving sessions. Uh, this semester we're doing some different things. We have only seven weeks of problem-solving and then the other three, three weeks are probably field trips and then about three weeks, I'm probably losing count here, but uh, we do some brainstorming exercises, which has been really fun. We just started that this semester in our third version of FLIP um, to try to get more experiential learning. Now, in those days, or, or guest speakers or field trips, I do um, give them an opportunity to turn something in, whether it's questions for the guest speaker or brainstorming comments, and that gets counted as part of an in-class exercise. And so there's more motivation for them to come, and we do, we do find that um, students do come to those yeah. for the most part. And just a comment on that, even as a student, 
70% attendance at this point in the semester is really great. Um, I personally am sometimes guilty of not going to some of my classes where I don't see the subject value or I think that the environment is unsupportive. And I know that in some of my other classes, it's an 80 person class and there's maybe 20 people there on a given day at this point in the semester. So seeing most of the students showing up for the homework is actually really heartening. I'm very happy about it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I don't mean to be crazy, but sometimes students coming, I mean, I've had students come when I lecture and I'm not really sure they're there. <laughs> so, you know, attendance to me is not necessarily the, the most important piece, but I can appreciate that you want, you know, students to come and, and experience this. I think if students find value, they come. And I think in this case, they know the homework's due and they know they're going to get help and they're not going to have to beat their head on a wall trying to figure something out. Um, and so I do find that, that they come. Yeah, uh, someone asked if I've tried using Doceri to create the videos. Um, you know, I think, I think how you create them is not as critical, I guess, to me as uh, the key thing I would recommend is short video segments. I haven't tried that. Um, just continuing it has been great, and they have this great setup that really worked for me. But I don't think, it, you know, everybody has to find their style of presenting the material. Um, the most important thing to me is that you keep it short. Um, and sort of get to the, you know, get to the core of it and allow students to go back and, and watch parts of it. I've even asked students, is it critical that my video is up there like it is right now? You can see me. Um, students do prefer that. I know sometimes that's the most difficult technical thing to get. So uh, I think particularly for a flipped class, it may not be critical that they see your face because they're going to see you in class. Um, but, you know, again, to me, the, the way of relaying the information is not as important as the actual flipping. So one of the, uh, maybe some other people will have good, uh, will have used those area will want to add comments to that one. But one of the other uh, videos that I saw up there in uh, YouTube land mm -hmm. was Katie Gimbart, and she talked about why, why does it have to be you? In other words, why can't yeah, you yeah. just point into a, to a Khan Academy video or somebody else has done it? Does it have to be you? What are, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Uh, I have thought about that, and I have sent students occasionally to Khan Academy in particular. I mean, I, I know there's some concern there with technical content, but I think it's great, uh, especially with weak acid. Sometimes I send them over there and say, hey, if you want a little extra. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I haven't had experience sending them elsewhere. I think faculty want to have control a little bit, and I probably feel that way. I think there are parts of it that you could definitely send students. If students forget, in, in this case, log and natural log, I feel like you know that's something you should know. So why don't you just go you know, get that somewhere else? I mean, that's a prereq kind of thing. If they forget it, I might point them to Khan Academy or something similar to find out. Um, I think that depends on who you're sending them to and whether you have, if you've watched all those videos and you say, yes, I'm going to, you know, maybe you teach, maybe you do your homework and everything and all your experiential learning based on those videos, I think that's fine. Um, but I haven't had experience using other people's videos. I think I would have a hard time. Well, one of the reasons she said she liked it that way, or like it needed to be you, yeah. was that students will trust that. If you're right. the one doing it, yeah. that's what's going to be on the it test. It feels more personal. Otherwise, they don't know. You yeah. know. It's always that, is this going to be on the test? Right. right. But somebody yeah, yeah. Talking, they don't feel as comfortable. And that has to do with a lot of what Emily taught us about you know, motivation. About, mm -hmm. you know, do you believe this is going to help you? Well, yeah, right. I do, because that's the same person. Yeah, that's so true. Put this test together, so. Yeah, I, I do think it's that would be my my recommendation. We had another question in the room. Betsy, speak up, please. So they can... <laughs> uh, were you able to tease out the difference in increases in motivation between students who traditionally did not do as well in that class versus students who were a little bit more self motivated? Did you see a difference in, in the standard deviation? I think that's a great question. We have we have a lot of data, and we are looking for people to help us analyze it. Um, we can certainly do that. We have not looked at, although we can, because again, we have the data, but we haven't looked at sort of GPA or um, that. I guess you could although, kind of look at that. Did, for did the one on? aspect that we did for the self-efficacy, we had them answer how confident they felt doing each part of the problem, but then we also, after we gave them the quiz, wrote down all their scores on the different parts of the problem to see how well they actually did. So that way, we could compare students who thought they were going to do well as compared to students who actually did well, but we haven't gotten that far yet. We have it. We just haven't we done have anything a lot with of it. data to analyze, but that's a great question. I think you know we need to look at that, and and you, you I, I have thought that way. Like you know, the, the really good, I don't want to say really good students, but the students who normally perform well, I think will still perform well. They 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 succeed in traditional lecture format. Probably they're very good at self teaching. You know, teaching themselves. 
Uh, the students who maybe, you know, are not self-motivated at all, you know, maybe this is not affecting them at all. It's my suspicion, although I don't have the data, is that it's the middle students who tend to struggle that really enjoy it the most. Just a quick follow-up yeah. question. Um, were you able to just see a difference in scores throughout yeah. the year? Was the score, you know, the average? Yeah, so the really interesting thing is that, and I, I guess I should have shown that, we did, uh, I tried to create final exams that were similar um, as much as I could uh, throughout these five, past five semesters, and um, we actually see no difference in final exam score, um, which is why we sort of turned to motivation and other things, and so we sort of looked at, well, we don't see much difference in the actual, as far as what's assessed by a final exam. Um, in fact, the data is so tight, I don't know how I could even get data there. <laughs> you know, in terms, of, in, in terms of how they're performing. Now, whether we're not asking the right kinds of questions to well, assess. A, I think your point about final exam score, what's measured on a final exam, yeah. is a really interesting one. But I think that the, you know, a lot of what people are looking for is transfer. Yeah. Right? So it's one thing to be able to pass a test. It's another thing to be able to use it in the world. Yes, I think that's right. And so I think yeah. that my, my, uh, I would love to see Also have not, which I would like. In fact, one of these students that I talked with last week said she went, she was interested in the gender differences, and we haven't looked at that at all. But again, we have the data. But you know, she wondered if maybe there would be a gender difference in her experience um, between different people, you know, having different experiences. I mean, I will share one sort of personal story. Um, we had a student a year ago who came in the class, and first day I, I did explain to them what we were doing, you know, so that they would understand and, and motivate it a little bit. And he came up after and very upset and said, I just think you're, you're going to make us teach ourselves. This is just, I, I just think you're going to make us teach ourselves. That's, you know, da, da, da. And so I said, well, I, I completely understand that, that you would feel that way. I said, but honestly, I'm going to be teaching you more than I traditionally would teach you because I'll be here, you know, when you actually get stuck and we'll work through it together and, you know, I'm not just going to leave after the lectures are over type of thing. And, um, but he, you know, after a couple of weeks was our biggest fan. I mean, he just loved it. He would still come to office hours because he just loved getting help. But, you know, he just thought, this is great. I just wish all my classes were taught this way. So you do hit some resistance at first because students are a little concerned about how that's going to go. But in general, we really find students like that. Um, and he was a you know, good, very, very student who came to office hours even if he didn't need to just because he thought he kind of. So did you see any change in office hours? Did you see more or less participation? Uh, we definitely see less. You know, we, I think we see less in general. Do you? Um, I see about the same. <laughs> I'll come to Emily. That's yeah. why. <laughs> yeah. My office hours are at night, so a lot more students come to them. Um, I can have anywhere from five to fifteen students on any given night. If there's a material that's particularly hard, I've had twenty-five students come to my office hours. Um, but the nice thing with the flip class is that my office hours then the students feel a lot more comfortable working with each other. And so I might be working with one student helping them with a problem, and meanwhile, three other students are working on the board, writing stuff out. Whereas the one semester that I was a TI for this as a traditional class, when students came to my office hours, they just kind of sat there and stared at me and waited for me to talk to them. And if you don't tell me what you need, I can't help you. And so seeing students help each other was a really nice difference. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, yeah. You think about how engineers work as members of teams, and they're, all, they're already you know, beginning to help each other. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even personally, having been a student and a teacher now, teaching taught me a lot more about the class than I ever learned while being a student in it. And so seeing them teach each other, I know that they're definitely getting a lot more out of it than they would be just listening to us talk. And so. you should share, I forgot. We actually, one of the times that she TA'd for me, we actually, um, sorry, one of the times that Emily TA'd for me, we actually taught it, I, I lectured taught it, so I did two flip lectured and went back to flip again because I wanted to redo the lectures and so I wanted to test them out sort of on a live audience before I went into a video uh, creation and I forgot that you did that. It's yeah. It's been a long time. <laughs> so um, maybe I want you to relay 
because she's taught for me. She's you know taught for me a couple of times when I couldn't make it to class. So yeah, I yeah. Relay that. So. I can talk about that. All right, so. Teaching lecture in a traditional class was terrifying. Uh, nobody spoke. Everyone just sat there and stared at me for 50 minutes. And I, it was terrible. I think I freaked out at the end and showed a video for the last 10 minutes because it was just terrible. And then the next semester teaching a flip class, it was so much better because everyone, they felt comfortable talking and asking questions. I really only spoke for the first 10 minutes of class because then they started working on homework and just it was a million times better. So from a teaching perspective, it was a lot more comfortable. I felt more comfortable speaking in front of everyone because the students that were there wanted to be there because attendance wasn't mandatory for that. And they were paying attention to me because they really wanted to know what it was that I was sharing with them. And so teaching in a flipped format was definitely much better. So. And the fact we talked about the person, the fact that they knew each other and they felt more comfortable with each other and talking to each other, that too has got to really help keep people in the program. Yeah. Somebody asked uh, a couple time of estimate. times ago about time, how long it takes to create this. Um, I uh, It depends how far along I think, I don't want to say this, it depends on how you typically teach. Um, I've had faculty say, well, I still if they still write on the board, and actually you can still do this if you just write on the board and don't have typed out notes, I think it's fine. You can write on a tablet, you can, um, I mean, if you're at Penn State, they've got the one button studio, you can write on a whiteboard and they can, so I, uh, in that sense, I'm not sure on a very basic level, you just teach how you would have normally taught. I think there is an extra level of anxiety because you know these are going to be there for a couple of years and so you maybe look over your notes a little more carefully. Um, but I have had typos in my lecture notes and I just basically send out an email saying, hey, here are the typos, go through and make these corrections. So. I know people are worried about that um, and making sure that they're perfect, but I just I do the very best I can, and and so there's a little more um, preparation, I guess, because you know it's going to be around for a while. Um, but otherwise, I don't think it takes much more work than a normal lecture class. And I think one of the key things with time for this is you're putting a lot of time in the very beginning and making these videos and putting them up. But then when you actually get to class, you don't have to worry as much about lesson plans because you're really just there to help the students with what they need. And so sometimes if the students are really comfortable working with each other, we'll just be standing at the front of the class waiting for them to have questions or needing us. And don't tell them Emily that. <laughs> we feel guilty doing it. But I mean, you put all this effort in at the very beginning, and then it really pays off in the long run because then you can make everything be about the students instead of worrying about, I need to make this lesson plan for this day, and I need to cover all this stuff. And it's just a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say time-wise, as a faculty member, um, you, know, you make a good homework, you'd have to do that anyway. And so the time after you prepare initially is is down. The anxiety level's down, you're not as worried about going in there because you're just prepared with helping them. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Um, do you know any other uh, departments or professors at Penn State who are experimenting with uh, there have been some people in engineering, uh, no one else in civil engineering, and um, but I know there's been a few uh, that have that have done some of this as well. Uh, even before we did, there was somebody, and I can't remember what engineering. Ask if anybody does anybody participating know of any? Does yeah, does anybody know? I know there's some engineering faculty that are that have been working on that as well a little bit. Um, I know uh, biology Okay. Okay. Um, so there are uh, what they call learning systems, which work with the students about the point. Mm -hmm. And they're different than the last two days. But mm -hmm. uh, students uh, on the graduate system that they're working with. Yeah. That's good. That's a great idea. And I've had. We're flipping some out at the med school. Ah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of classes where they haven't done a 100% flip, but they flipped a couple of sections of it or a couple of lectures. And so I know that for me, one of my statics and dynamics classes, we had a week where we watched videos online and then we came to class and worked on the homework. And so it wasn't the full class, but it was that full week of what we did. Darren has a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, sure. A few minutes ago, you mentioned that this flipped classroom sort of alleviates that feeling of a student where they learn something in a lecture and then they just go home and keep their head against the homework to figure it out. And they just don't keep the classroom for an office hour. Um, 
on the other hand, that sense of you know, beating your head against the wall to solve a problem on your own can be very really useful, uh, especially in the engineering sense when you go out and even though you're working as part of a team, you usually expect to be something of an expert on whatever it is you know. Mm -hmm. So is there an opportunity for the students to be individually challenged, or do you see evidence of students trying for a little while and then saying, well, I can stop trying now and just ask my question. So it's fine. I can answer this a little bit. Okay. Okay. So one of the good things about having the weekly <coughs> quiz where they are being tested on their own is they have to be able to have mastered the material on the homework in order to get a good grade on the quiz. And so I know that in other classes people will like share homework and they'll say, oh, I'll do half the problems and you do half the problems and we'll just copy each other's and they don't go through the effort of actually learning how to do it. But for this, since we do give them quizzes every week and we try to make them a little bit more challenging than the homework and force them to really think about what they're doing and not just filling like plug and chug, fill in the blanks. And so having that encouraged them to put a lot more effort into the homework. And so that was one of the key things. So have you changed the weight between homework and quizzes? The quizzes are worth a lot more than the homeworks. Right? Yeah, the quizzes are about 50%, the homework's about 20%. Yeah. Something so like that, up, you know, up and down. Yeah. yeah. Most students are less likely to lose their security deposit if they're not banging their heads against the wall. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, well, I think what happens is, Instead of, I mean, hopefully, you know, students bang their head and eventually get it, but I think more likely than not, they just don't get it, and they might copy or they might just not turn it at all. Yeah. So, um, but but if there are students who really feel, and I think there are students who really like to work independently, and those students are welcome to do that. I don't, you know, when um, we I've had students say, well, why don't, or people say, why don't you force them to be in teams? And I don't want to do that. You know, I think if people want to work on their own, they should be able to work on their own. You know, and. And I think even in a professional setting, you might get stuck on just one little thing. You might go to your office mate and say, hey, I'm just stuck on this one little thing and work it out and then go back. And I think have, that's, have yeah. Have you looked at the number of students who dropped the class compared to when you're flipped versus your lecture? Um, no, that would be good. Yeah. Not many drop, though. Sometimes the first week they switch into a different section. <laughs> <laughs> they get scared and run away. Yeah, All sometimes. Right. So, you think, so, that, so they can always leave the flip section. Go well, the we do have two sections of this class. It would be yeah. fun to watch them. But also sometimes yeah. students will flip into our section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Flip. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean yeah. that pun. Yeah. But it would be good to look at that. I mean, we certainly we haven't looked at that, but we have, we have the data. We have all this data. Lots of data. Even when, you look how far in the semester. Okay. Yeah. Maybe they, they might be more likely to drop instantly when they say flip classroom. That's weird. I'm out. Right. But then also, Right. I, I don't think students don't tend to drop out that much just because I don't know they've got to get through the curriculum one way or another. Yeah. You know, they don't really have the luxury of choosing. It's a required class. class. Yeah. So. so they just kind of. I mean, typically engineering students don't. They're in. They stay in. You know. I don't know that. I don't know. I mean, we look at the data. I don't know. We don't get. Yeah. 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 Another yeah. thing I should say is that this course just happened just the way it is. It's a required course for all civil engineers. Most of the civil engineers, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of civil engineers want to build bridges and structure and do structures. And so this is a chemistry class for them, basically. So they don't tend to love it to begin with. Um, so I'm not sure what that means, but you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, we try to make it a little bit easier for That's them. That's not always way. true. Oh. I'm a civil student who Except liked for it. Emily who but likes it, but yeah. it depends. We get both. We get students who take it who are in the environmental track within civil, and so they're usually taking it as sophomores or juniors, and they need to take it then because it's a prereq for so many other classes. So even if they're not doing as well as they want, they can't afford to really drop it necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then we have the students who hate chemistry and put it off until their last semester, and they can't drop it because then they won't graduate. So I feel like that also has something to do with attrition rates if we had to consider what semester standing they are and why they're taking the class. And they're just happy to get through it so they can take another class. Yeah. But it'd be interesting to look at. Have we covered all the questions on, on the uh, chat box? Yeah. See a lot of thank yous. I, I had my own. This was a great session. I really appreciate that. There's a lot of rich content here. You mentioned a paper. I don't know uh -huh. if it's possible to put a, a draft of the paper on the website when we post the report. A lot of people would be interested. 
That'd be and, good. Okay. And uh, again, we'll, this, this will be recorded. Uh, well, this is, it has been recorded. Yeah. And when we post the recording, we might post some other links uh, for people to answer okay. questions about K-12 and uh, other things, too. So feel mm -hmm. free to use comments. We had people ask about other Penn State classes that have been flipped. If you hear about one, come back, find this, and, and add a comment so mm -hmm. we can sort of keep a log of the classes that are flipping. Or maybe we'll find a better place to, to host a, a list of flipped classes and Penn State on the website somewhere. Uh, any yeah. other last last chance for questions before we thank our presenters and call it a day? Not a day, an hour. <laughs> call it a session. Friday. Friday. It's a Friday. <laughs> yeah, it is a Friday. It is a lot of time. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having uh, us. It's been great. There is probably talking. You won't be able to hear that. <laughs> <laughs>